good spot. Whatever. Um, but Richard Rorty, in the article we had, uh, uh, Love and Money, uh, talks about um, a book, a, a novel, uh, which is also a movie, uh, Howard's End. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, although um, some pretty famous actors have been in uh, one or <coughs> two versions of Howard's End. Um, but the, the main point of, of the article is how do we, uh, how do we feel about people that have less uh, in the world uh, that are impoverished, essentially. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's pretty easy to say, gosh, if you're an American, you're already living better uh, than three-fifths of the world, probably, uh, even if you're uh, in the poverty level in the United States, you're probably living as well as some of the wealthy in three-fifths of the world, right? I think that's, of course, obvious. That's why so many people want to come to the United States, right? Um, but what can we do to help them? That's, of course, uh, the problem uh, that Richard Rorty is trying to deal with. And his uh, point that he's making at, at a very late point in his life, uh, relatively speaking, he was I suppose in his 70s, where he, he wrote that, uh, was that you know, when you ha get right down to it, uh, despite all the efforts uh, that people have made uh, throughout the world, uh, it's just a hopeless task. There's, there's no way, uh, and, and he mentioned specifically the one professor in India who explains, if you remember, uh, that he's talked with so many villagers and they're absolutely convinced that they have to have at least eight children or they won't be able to have someone taking care of them in their old age. Right? And of course the, the problem, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the economics of it, but if everyone's trying to have eight children, you're going to have uh, a billion plus uh, people in India uh, which is not really able to support that kind of population and the kind of life that we have here, where we have, what, 300 million, not billion, obviously, uh, people in the United States. Is it 350 now? How many do we have? Anybody remember offhand? 360. 360? Uh, that's still pretty impressively low, uh, considering uh, all the space we have. And, and Alaska is absolute. I mean, one of the reasons I live here is because there's so few people. <laughs> Hopefully enough that I have classes, right? It's a balance. <laughs> but at the same time, I love being able to go out on my deck and sit there and look at the trees and feed the birds and read Hegel and not have homeless people living in my yard. I know, Anchorage is doing its best to clear things, and as a result, uh, I've noticed that there's a new home, homeless encampment just as you go on to Boniface uh, yeah. at the gate. I yeah. even emailed the, you know, the, the post and said, hey, you know, this nice new homeless camp that's right there at, at the gate is kind of you know, affecting the overall impression as you enter into the, the post. So. <laughs> Of course, on the other hand, I feel, you know, concerned for them, but at the same time, what do you do? Um, okay. So that's the question he poses for us. Uh, that, you know, there's just a, a point at which we're not going to be able to help. Um, and he says, the people in the South. And remember, we, we briefly thought that that's pretty unclear what you could mean by people in the South, because especially from here in Alaska, everybody's South. <laughs> Canada is South, you know, yep. you know, depending on, you know, where you are. Uh, 
So what what do we mean by that? Did he mean the southern United States? That that would be a, a, a an issue, uh, but. Um, I, I use third world as, as an interesting issue um, on that. But so my, my suggestion, based on several sources, uh, including Charles Taylor's The Sources of the Self uh, and, and Harold Bloom's uh, uh, Shakespeare uh, uh, and the invention of humanity, or the human, right? right? Shakespeare, the invention of the human. Remember where he argues that in that in Hamlet, in that scene where Hamlet has that that monologue, where he's speaking to himself, and he says, uh, "To be or not to be." Right. So everyone knows that that phrase at least. If you don't remember the rest of it, of course, who the heck? knows that. I remember watching Orson Welles years ago on the Johnny Carson show, which used to be, well, you know, uh, but at, at one point Johnny got Orson to actually do that uh, speech and so he gave that speech and it was very moving and everyone applauded and so on. Uh, and then later on in their discussion Johnny asked Orson, do you ever forget your lines? And he says, oh, yes, of course, all the time. There was an awful lot of new Shakespeare tonight in what I just said. And, of course, everyone laughed because no one knows enough of, of the speech to know whether he invented new stuff or not, right? <laughs> but that is the point where Harold Bloom argues that's the beginning of the modern human. And what, so, so it's, it, and, and I, I like the idea of, of thinking of our minds as metaphorically like computers. And, you know, you start off with the computer and it doesn't do anything. It turns on and looks at you and says, well, right? <laughs> and then you have to have programs that you install on the computer. And then it can do your Excel worksheets and it can do your word processing and it can look up your pornography, you know, all the things you <laughs> want it to do. Sorry, did I say that? That was it's kind of a joke. That's on camera. <laughs> well, I mean, if you look at how many people watch it, you know, it's like four or five. <laughs> and I know since I always watch it at least once, that's mostly me. Right? So I'm not too worried about that. Right? Um, uh, but I'm, it's the programs that you add on to the computer that enable the computer to do the things it does, right? Um, and notice another point, that if you have a Mac compared to a PC, you have to buy different, you have to buy Apple software, right? Is it it's still that way, right? You have to buy the right software for the operating system, because unless you have the right operating system, you're not gonna be able to load the program you want. So you have to keep that in mind when you're buying a computer with the operating system, what programs are you planning on using on it, right? Well, if you think of a human being as that same kind of thing, right, where do you get your programs from? I mean, you start off, you know, teach me something, right? Right? right. We, feed, we feed it electricity, formula, or whatever, right? Uh, but where does where do the programs come from? Parents. Yeah, all of those, right? And by the, and what is the operating system? What would you you know metaphorically? What would be the operating system? Your brain. Well, yeah, you have to have that. That would be the C, that would be the CPU, right? I would think the operating system is the language you speak. Remember, remember when we talked about different kinds of languages of different grammatical uh, structures and interpret the world differently. By the way, if, you, if you're not familiar with that, um, it's referred to as the Sapir or Worf. So some of you are familiar with it. So, pure Whorf hypothesis. We still argue over that. 
linguistic relativity. As far as I can tell at the moment, it has more advocates than it, you, it had for a while. Uh, it swings uh, back and forth uh, depending on uh, who's, who's in favor. Noam Chomsky, who's on my list, uh, and I think even one of you are doing your, your term paper on Noam Chomsky, um, was famous uh, for thinking that all human languages are basically similar and have deep or uh, depth grammar uh, that's essentially the same, that it's, it's human grammar. Uh, um, uh, but there are contemporaries, uh, Everett, for, um, forget what Everett's first, first name is. Uh, he's the author that wrote, uh, Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes. Uh, but he's got several other books out. He, he had spent a lot, uh, like 20 plus years living in the Amazon with the Piraha people. Um, uh, and, and he argues that significant differences from one language to another do impact the way people view the world. Uh, and there are others. I think I mentioned Lara uh, Bar Brodsky. Br I always have trouble with her second name. Let me see if I... T-Mobile has a plan designed just for you. And for a limited time only, now you can get two lines for just $55, including unlimited talk, text, and data, plus no annual service contracts. Only at T-Mobile. So, I'll be speaking to you using language because I can. This is one of these magical abilities that we humans have. We can transmit really complicated thoughts to one another. So what I'm doing right now is I'm making sounds with my mouth as I'm exhaling. I'm making tones and hisses and puffs, and those are creating air vibrations in the air. Those air vibrations are traveling to you. They're hitting your eardrums, and then your brain takes those vibrations from your eardrums and transforms them into thoughts. I hope, I hope that's happening. So because of this ability, we humans are able to transmit our ideas across vast reaches of space and time. Right? We're able to transmit knowledge across, uh, across minds. I can put a bizarre new idea in your mind right now. I could say, imagine a jellyfish waltzing in a library while thinking about quantum mechanics. Right. Now, if everything has gone relatively well in your life so far, you probably haven't had that thought before. <laughs> but now I've just made you think it through language. Right. Now, of course, there isn't just one language in the world. There are about 7,000 languages spoken around the world. And all the languages differ from one another in all kinds of ways. So some languages have um, different sounds, they have different vocabularies, and they also have different structures, very importantly, different structures. That begs the question, does the language we speak shape the way we think? Now, this is an ancient question. People have been speculating about this question for forever. Uh, Charlemagne, Holy Roman Emperor, said, to have a second language is to have a second soul. Strong statement that language crafts reality. But on the other hand, Shakespeare has Juliet say, what's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Well, that suggests that maybe language doesn't craft reality. These arguments have gone back and forth for uh, thousands of years. So she's interesting. If you're um, you're curious about this and never heard about it before, um, and she brings up some very startling examples um, uh, that seem to demonstrate that yes, uh, different languages uh, enable different ways of perceiving the world. Um, so, so I'm an advocate myself. Remember, my first career was as an army linguist. Um, yes? No. Okay. All right. So I would use the concept of language as the closest comparative metaphor to an operating system. And, and, and 
obviously you can have multiple languages. Uh, you can also uh, imagine loading different operating systems on a computer. You can, you can do that. I believe Max, because of the PC world dominating uh, computing, uh, they have a, a, a Mac version of Windows uh, that you could load on a Mac uh, that will enable you to run Windows programs, from what I understand, to some extent. I don't know if it still, still does or if it's very acceptable to do that or, or whatever. Um, um, but if, if um, you think of that, if, if a, a person comes from a culture that speaks and they've grown up speaking one type of language, and I think I've, I've mentioned I had a student who was from Samoa, and he could not catch the difference between all horses are animals and all animals are horses. I, I remember even, uh, I think, looking at some of you and saying, right, all horses are animals is true, and everybody, yes, that's true, and all animals are horses is false. Yes, that's pretty obvious. Um, uh, but the person from Samoa that I was talking with just could not get the difference between those two statements. And that's, I, I'm still puzzled over why that would be, right? Um, uh, but, I mean, there's, of course, some individuals have brain damage thanks to things like fetal alcohol or traumatic brain injuries, things of that sort. You mentioned that. Um, but you could also, I would think, uh, be uh, in, a, in a situation where the language that you're using as your main operating system doesn't have the structure that enables that kind of a logic. Yes? Does that, does that make sense? Um, that's, uh, we usually think of it as the Greek influence, Aristotle's logic, um, uh, and, and we could trace it to the verb to be, literally. Uh, so, so when you look at Western European languages, and, and I think even Eastern European languages, all those influenced by the Greek language. They've evolved structures that include uh, the verb to be, uh, but when we look at Asian languages like Chinese, for example, they do not have a comparable uh, uh, structure, so they don't have the verb to be. And so you end up even with Chinese philosophers trying to figure out, well, how do the Chinese people then explain true statements? Uh, versus false statements. And I, I think I, I always mention the one uh, more recent book where he says that the Chinese handle that by being pragmatists. So they, they essentially have a way of, of saying that this statement is you know, more important than these statements, you know, so that you kind of you know, determine uh, which statements are more useful. They're not actually saying that these are true, because they, in a sense, can't do that. But I don't even understand how to do that. And even trying to understand what the Chinese people are doing, speaking English, doesn't work. Because I am translating the problem and the Chinese into English, which automatically gives it that structure, which means I can't see the problem that they have with the structure. Does that make sense? Am I explaining that right? But so here's the issue, then. Certain programs that are installed in your brains naturally because you grow up in a society with your peers, your parents, your church, you know, all the things you were mentioning, right, are assuming your operating system will naturally, and, and, and in fact, I don't even think your parents are thinking, you know, to themselves, we have to make sure we instill self-referential uh, thinking in our child. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they think that. I know I never did, right? Right? But nonetheless, it happens. You know, at a certain point, you end up becoming a modern person. And you're, you get up. Yes, Douglas? Yeah. I, I, was just, I was thinking as you were talking about language, uh, a good reference is, and you probably know all about this, would be in World War II, when our Native Americans were used as code talkers. Mm -hmm. They didn't have specific words for our armament, or our airplanes, or fighters, and bombers. They had to create certain categories within their language that just didn't exist. And I can see where that would be a, uh, an issue of, or a barrier mm -hmm. 
it comes to modern and non-modern, because there are some that just haven't developed to the extent we have to create these words for the new things that we have produced, mm -hmm. like computers or mm -hmm. airplanes. So. Well, UPIC, for example, um, didn't have a lot of words for the, the objects that the Russians brought with them. And when we look at the UPIC vocabulary today, there are at least 2,000 different what are called Russian loan words that have become UPIC words for exactly that, that reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and we have a lot of words in English that we're not, they're not English words. I think that I, I mentioned funky music. Mentioned fun. Where did we get the expression funky music? You know, I'm in Germany and I'm visiting the funk term, which is the radio tower. And it dawns on me, funk is the Russian, uh, is the German word for radio. The funk apparat, right? <laughs> you know, so where did we get that funky, and even sillier, I remember being in basic training and I was issued what everyone was calling a fart sack. And that was kind of embarrassing, you know, that, you know, well, uh, it's obvious, it's a sleeping bag, you know, with the, uh, the food you eat in the army, you know, when you're out there, you know, on, uh, you know, in your sleeping bag, you know, that's what's going to happen. You know, it's just part of the human, you know, situation, right? Um, but then arriving in Germany, you find out that a sleeping bag is referred to in German as a fart sack, which literally means a travel bag. So they weren't <laughs> saying, right? You see? Fart. Yeah, f f you know. In fact, arriving in Berlin Tegel Airport, you know, the van of us driving out to, to go to the base, and there's a big sign, Gute Fart in Deutschland, right? <laughs> Which doesn't mean have a nice fart while you're in Germany. <laughs> but it has a nice, have a nice trip while you're in Germany. Right? So do they have a different word for farts? You know, that was, it it's also word? funny because uh, oh, yeah. I remember the one time uh, I saw if you, if you're, you have a uh, problem with your muffler system on your car, uh, it's referred to an auspoof problem which was just absolutely hilarious to me. Uh, auspoof, you know, that's, uh, yeah. But I don't actually, believe it or not, I never learned the word for fart, the English word fart, which, I, you know, it might actually be a German word. But I so, heard one colloquial for it was called Bunsenmachen. Okay, <laughs> I can understand that. <laughs> you make a, a little boom. Right? Mm. <laughs> I suppose. Um, but I, English isn't really a language. If you think about it, it's a hodgepodge, which, by the way, is Hungarian, hodgy podgy. Uh, it's a mishmash, which is Yiddish. It's an oleo, which is Latin, I suppose. What is a good English word for what English is? Pizza. A what? Maybe pizza. A pizza? Pizza. Yeah. Pizza. Everybody likes pizza when you come to America. You but pizza. pizza is Italian. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Burger. Burger or hot dog. Burger is German. Oh. Darn. So okay. Darn is Italian. <laughs> There are English words. Death is an English word. In fact, I believe death is like one of the first English words. There's an interesting phrase right here. This is about when English is, is starting. And this says, full wise is he that can himself but he know. That's kind of Chaucer. Right? He's considered no, to be, pardon? Snow is English, isn't it? As a derivative of like Dutch and German and Schnee. Schnee, yeah. So, I, I, 
when you're you're looking at German, uh, you've got Süddeutsch or or Schwabish, and then Bayerisch, but with Bavarian, and then uh, think of Hochdeutsch, but then you move up to the Netherlands, which speak Dutch, which is really Deutsch, right? And then you cross the channel into England, and, and you could just see the words transforming themselves from zwei, zwo, tu. You know, so, so, so you know, in some respects, it's pretty obvious that English is an Anglo-Saxon structured uh, a language with about 80% of a vocabulary from France, the French. Uh, I think it's great when kids learn Latin roots and Greek roots because that helps them uh, you know, when they're, they're parsing different uh, languages. So I, I think I mentioned the one uh, Samoan uh, who, different Samoan, uh, but who wanted to learn big words and ended up uh, looking at the thesaurus yeah. and seeing all the different words for you know, child, rugrat, infant, neonate, you know, you know, and you know, she was absolutely baffled. How? Why are there so many words when in Samoan there's only one word for all of those? And you want to understand? How do you even teach a person the nuances of difference when the when it's appropriate to use the different different ones? How do you, how do you do that? You know, have to live in the language immerse yourself in the, the discussions with the people using it in order to learn that. It's kind of amazing. But, so, part of the programs that are in, installed in our brains are socialization skills. And the way, you, and, and this is, I think, the real puzzle, because if you already think about yourself, you have a sense of who you are, uh, and you worry about how you look, and you worry about uh, how people are treating you, and things of that sort, you already have a, a modern program installed in you that folks like Charles Taylor and Harold Bloom and others are arguing are not installed in all human beings from the beginning, from our birth. Uh, now, now, roughly around two, you do recognize yourself. So, so children looking in the mirror at around, it's, it's called the mirror test, right? That they recognize themselves. And we could do this with other animals too, and we could identify which animals know that that's their, their reflection. And, other, and, and some, I, I think it's pretty interesting, parakeets don't recognize uh, that that's them in, their, in the mirror you put in their cage. And so they keep trying to feed it because they think it's another bird. And so you have to keep cleaning parakeets' mirrors because they make a mess of them. But if you have a parrot, it doesn't do that because it knows that that's itself in the mirror. So, so parrots, uh, they're obviously not a hominid uh, or, you know, a, a great ape. Or any, I mean, it's a bird, right? But nonetheless, they have some language. Uh, they know them, their name. They, they come when they're called. If you have the right kind of parrot, <laughs> right? Even if it's flying outside, loose, which is dumb. I don't recommend it. But if you call it, it actually will come. Uh, all that sort of thing. Um, but so somehow in, in this, what we've got going is the argument that there's incremental uh, differences that are reflected, say, in the literature uh, over time. So that's what Charles Taylor does in his book. Um, in which some kind of democracies have been operative. We've seen the 
the roots or bases of elite power shift from landed power to large, owning large industry to now finance. So that's Charles Taylor, just so you get an idea who he is. Um, uh, and in his book, The Sources of the Self, he starts with Plato and incrementally follows it through the whole course of Western history uh, to try to figure out when do significant little leaps occur that change the oper not the operating system so much, but the, that's just my metaphor, right? Uh, but um, the programs that are running in the brain. You know, so, so when we, we think then of, of Harold Bloom talking about Shakespeare being a significant individual in this process, incrementally changes our thinking to ourselves. And by the way, if you think about it, that's before Descartes. Descartes would have been reading uh, Shakespeare, wrote close contemporaries, but slightly ahead. Uh, I mentioned Francis Bacon is also pr pretty interesting in this respect. But, but when you, you look at what happens here, we've got the Reformation, which is a rebellion against the church. Uh, and that influences uh, <coughs> John Knox, who goes to Scotland, uh, starts the Presbyterian Church, starts the, and the Presbyterian Church establishes a council that rules the church. Instead of a top-down uh, Vatican-ruled uh, 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 church, the presbyters rule their own churches and their own locality, and that Shortly thereafter, ends up leading to a democracy in the towns where you, the same sort of presbyters are deciding what the town rules should be. And that eventually, of course, leads to the idea of uh, um, a, a social contract, which is our United States contemporary legitimating narrative. Uh, that says the reason our government is legitimate is because we vote. We, the people, have established this uh, constitution. It's, uh, I mean, I wasn't there, obviously, although I know fr I have a friend who was actually at the Alaska Constitution, Vic, 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 what's Vic's? Fisher, Vic Fisher. Um, uh, he's still alive and, by the way, still probably... Uh, uh, ushering people at the symphony. It's kind of amazing. Uh, and by the way, oh, it's a little plug here. Uh, the symphony tomorrow night, Saturday, the first uh, this evening, I'll pass this around, um, is uh, focused on a French connection. I'll, I'll pass this around. If you'd like to, I highly recommend going to the symphony if you've never been to one. Um, and there's probably plenty of tickets. We have been sold out for years, uh, so pass that around. Um, okay, so Charles Taylor gives us incremental uh, adjustments to the, which are still happening, by the way, of course. We're still, uh, it's just like your computer at home. Every time you turn around, Windows is giving you another update, right? You probably don't even realize what the update's doing. You know, they might, you know, uh, change something about the way it's uh, displayed. But I suspect most of it is trying to prevent hackers uh, from uh, sneaking into portals or whatever that they've found. Uh, and so you need protection from the environment out there or we're all going to be uh, stuck. Hopefully not. Um, so the human mind is being upgraded constantly. So, so both Richard Morty and Charles Taylor and Harold Bloom and a whole host of other folks, Francis Fukuyama, most of the philosophers I have listed actually would all, I think, uh, follow uh, in agreeing that there's incremental learning differences that change the way an individual thinks about themselves and the world and the way they perceive the world. And, and in fact, 
you know, that's a major difference between a lot of the people in the world uh, uh, who are non-modern and people that are, right? I think I mentioned uh, France, one of their biggest problems since they've opened their borders and allowed lots of migrants to come into France is that nonetheless, uh, even though they want to respect people from different cultures, at the same time as they welcome them, there's a clear attitude that within two years you ought to become French and think the way we do. So we'll respect your religion, but within two years we hope you won't. Literally. I mean, that you're, you're going to give it up because you'll realize, you know, secular, the secular point of view in France is considered to be the only smart way a thinking person uh, should, should live, right? That's, that's not Catholic, not Protestant, not Islamic, not... Oh, I, I loved it. Did you see the uh, Pastafarian give his invocation for the Kenai? Uh, did, you, did you see that? I heard about that. I didn't watch it. I like the part where you had a calendar on the schedule. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And, and the last word instead of amen is ramen. Yes. Hilarious, right? Think about it. That's, that's making fun of all religions. That's, you know, that's, that's a religion that's making fun of all religions. Um, I'm not so sure that that's a good thing. I, I'm absolutely convinced that, that um, there are values, of course, to religion besides the fact that our values come from our religion, right? So, hmm. I didn't see that. Where's that coming from? That Roman thing you were just talking about? Uh, where did that come from? We will now receive an invocation offered by Barrett and Fletcher. You may either remain standing or be seated. No one is required to participate. So this is down in the Kenai. Just last week. I'm Barrett Fletcher. I'm the founding pastor of the First Lower Peninsula Congregation of Pastafari. We're gathered to do the business of the First Lower Peninsula Borough. Make the rules for behavior and property, levy taxes, and determine how to disperse them wisely. Fund in education, waste management, law enforcement, transportation, and health. An attempt to settle disputes, whether petty or substantial. A few of the assembly members seem to feel that they can't do this work without being overseen by a higher authority. So I'm called to invoke the power of the true inebriated creator of the universe, drunken tolerator of all the lesser and more recent gods, and maintainer of gravity here on Earth. <coughs> May the great flying spaghetti monster rouse himself from his stupor and let his newly appendages ground each assembly member in their seats, <clears throat> reminding them of the purpose of their election to this body and helping them to stay focused on the tasks they and may help them to easily acquit each of these tasks, avoiding any pettiness and irrelevant disagreement, and may he provide each of them satisfaction in the perception of accomplishment and allow them true relaxation and an ample supply of their favorite beverage at the end of this evening's work. Amen. <laughs> That's, I think, better than the Satanists that basically encouraged oh, Randy Rainbow to live. Oh. <laughs> Is that the, the one you recommend? I, I don't know if that's the... Sorry. Okay. Okay. So I should move on to um, our topics for tonight because it's already, 
almost an hour since we've got started and we haven't uh, uh, discussed uh, those uh, that I have posted for this evening. Um, the first is Schopenhauer, um, The Vanity of Existence. Let me, let me pull up Schopenhauer. Prefer Wikipedia, actually. Um, that that is such an ugly picture. Um, but what is is kind of funny if you look up Schopenhauer with his poodle. Isn't there a saying like you start looking like your dog, or your dog starts looking like you? Well, but it, that can't really be true. Although, I, I, as I drive around and I see people walking their dogs, I always try to compare and see if you know their hair is, their clothes, do they match, uh, the size, the way they waddle. That's not really true, obviously. I mean, especially if you've got more than one dog and they don't look alike, right? You know, which, which dog are you gonna look like? I have two Chihuahuas <laughs> and the St. Bernard. So, you know, if, if I'm looking like my dogs, it's mostly because all the hair from the St. Bernard is all over me. You know, that's, that's about as close as it gets. Um, but there's, there's a, a famous uh, picture. There's lots of different silhouettes of him with his poodle. As far as I know, the poodle was the only creature that liked it. And that's true for me, too. I really don't like Schopenhauer. Um, uh, main reason is I really like Hegel. When I was in college and I you know, had my mind totally destroyed, you know, in intro to philosophy, and was convinced that all the things I believed in in high school were wrong, and then went to, you know, Plato and thought, yes, Plato. And then Aristotle came along and just, did that to Plato, and I thought, oh, but Aristotle is great. And then, you know, all the, you know, different uh, followers of Aristotelian thought, and then St. Augustine, I kind of moved easily into that, and I thought, yes, that's obviously the best meta narrative. Uh, and then uh, the reintroduction of Aristotle with Aquinas, and I thought, oh, now things are getting even more complicated. And then the moderns, and of course, Descartes came in and said, nope, math is the only thing you can really trust, right? And then, and then everything that happened until you get you know, to David Hume, basically absolutely convinced that Descartes is even wrong in thinking that the cogito proves that you exist. Because David Hume asks, how do you know you're a persistent self? <laughs> Am I the same person I was yesterday? No. Am I the same person that I was just when I came into the room? No, I'm changing constantly. <laughs> so in what sense am I this sum uh, that Descartes uh, finds to be the rock on which his uh, knowledge is based, right? Well, there's no sum there. <laughs> you know, it's constantly undergoing change, etc. Uh, so, and by the way, uh, if we uh, look at uh, today, uh, um, one of the examples of the current attitude uh, of who we are, being no one, uh, I'll just refer to this. But being no one, the self-model theory of subjectivity. Uh, so, so in a sense, the idea that we have any objects, I think I mentioned this already when we talked about the nature of physics changing things. We no longer believe that there are objects, material objects, because when we get right down to it, everything is energy in an arrangement, and the arrangement's constantly changing. So there are no real objects uh, anymore. Instead, there are sets 
of predicates, <laughs> right? And the same thing applies to us, obviously, that I'm not a self so much as I'm a set of processes that are basically running, right? <laughs> right? You know, so, and some of those processes, of course, are self-referential, you know, thinking that I'm who I've been, you know, for, for years, et cetera. But in a sense, it's, it's a creation of our society, not an actual self that really exists that way. Does that make sense to think of it that way? Um, so this was, this was pretty uh, 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 devastating when I was a kid uh, to find that you know, even, even my, my sense that I had uh, developed uh, through college uh, to think of how I understand the universe, the world, my place in it, etc., uh, was totally uh, groundless. That it was it was in flux. And then came Hegel and fixed it all for me. You know, it was amazing. Uh, and so I was very thrilled with Hegel. And Schopenhauer was one of his students, a graduate student. In fact, uh, Hegel. Uh, approved his PhD thesis uh, and uh, Schopenhauer's thesis was that Hegel was all wrong <laughs> and yet Hegel still approved it uh, and then Schopenhauer said okay I'm going to teach classes at the exact same hours that Hegel teaches his classes and he predicted within two years Hegel will have no students but within two years Schopenhauer had no students and so he quit and he went and he lived as a, a kind of a, a loner in, Fair, in uh, not Fairbanks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> shoot, I can't think of the mate. Uh, on, on mine. Uh, what's the? Frankfurt. Frankfurt, thank you. Sheesh. Uh, that's where he went to live uh, for the rest of his life and write. Um, and his... Uh, work was also very depressing. Uh, there's lots of interesting reasons why. I, so I, I really disliked him uh, because uh, I thought his philosophy was a throwback uh, to a misunderstanding of Kant, essentially, so he's not accepting Hegel's advance, right? You know, there's progress, and Schopenhauer goes backwards, right? And I thought, well, that's dumb, right? Uh, plus, he's mean. To Hegel, you know, I thought, yes, you know, family guy, you know, etc. Schopenhauer as a poodle, you know, uh, you know, poodles aren't so bad, you know, but you know, they're they're not really the nicest dogs, but you know, um, well, I did read a book uh, by uh, uh, Rudiger uh, Safransky on. Uh, uh, Schopenhauer. There's some other excellent books out there on Sh uh, uh, Schopenhauer. Uh, Brian McGee has a great book out on Schopenhauer. But the Safransky book really helped me understand why Schopenhauer was the way he was. Even his mother didn't like him. <laughs> and he was a rich, spoiled brat. He didn't have blonde hair, but... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> help but throw those in every once in a while. And he was a rich, spoiled brat and had traveled in lots of places. He lived in France for a while. He lived in England for a while. So he spoke English. He spoke French, uh, multiple other languages, and so on. Um, and here he is studying with Hegel, who grew up only in Germany, didn't have that kind of money, didn't have that kind of life. Uh, and Schopenhauer didn't like him because... He wasn't a man of the world, and he felt like what he knew was only book learning, but not, not experience, right? So I could understand that. But um, uh, his, uh, his desire to be liked was, was tremendous. He uh, spent a lot of time visiting Goethe, uh, if you're familiar with uh, Goethe in Weimar. Uh, and um, he always wanted to be thought of as a special person, but instead, when you visited Goethe, Goethe was the only special person in the room. So it was kind of an asshole that way, right? You know, but everybody loved Goethe, so they would all come you know, to his tea parties and things. 
Uh, and Schopenhauer always wanted to be especially noted, but no one really paid him any attention. So he was just grumpy and miserable. But his philosophy also incorporated Buddhism for the first time, apparently, a major philosopher in Europe incorporated Buddhism. And if you think of Buddhism just basically as a philosophy that says um, life really sucks, you know, and there's only one thing you could really do to get out of the suckiness of existence, and that is to take the eightfold path to gradually disattach yourself to all the different aspects of life so that once your body dies, your soul is released into nirvana, right? And you're essentially escaping from existence, right? Uh, and so, so all the, the aspects of the Eightfold Path is essentially that ascetic kind of teaching that you see with the... Uh, uh, the, the various orders in Christianity, you know, the, the ascetic monks that, that literally are trying to avoid attachment to things, control the body, right? Not let the body's sensuousness uh, drive the way you live, but instead let mind over matter, right? You know, the, the body is corruption, right? The, the soul, the spirit is essentially the higher nature of us and so what we've got to do is feed that and avoid feeding the body right so so in that sense it's a very negative kind of philosophy by the by the way um, uh, Pope Benedict the 16th um, argues in one of his books uh, toleration and truth and toleration or truth So the, the book is, um, the book says uh, Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, remember that was his actual name as opposed to Benedict uh, the 16th. Um, he was Pope John Paul II, I love you. Uh, uh, that's, he always said that, Pope John Paul II uh, always said that. He was um, Pope John Paul II's right hand man uh, and um, while he was, everyone referred to him as the Pope's Rottweiler. Because <coughs> he was German, right? Uh, and Rottweilers are cattle dogs, Roman cattle dogs, right? Um, but the, um, uh, once he became the Pope, they changed it. Instead of being the Pope's Rottweiler, he was now our German shepherd. Isn't that cute? You like these little tidbits I just throw in to screw up everything? Um, but uh, what he says in this book is that um, the main difference between Christianity and Buddhism is that essentially they're the same, but in Christianity you also believe that there's an other, that, the God, that God exists outside of the universe, whereas in Buddhism, the universe is all there is. And that's a significant difference, though. But nonetheless, when you, it's kind of amazing. When you look at the hierarchy of the major religions and you go up uh, the theological uh, uh, studies of them, the, cl the higher they go, the more similar they all become. Uh, so that I don't see a big difference between them uh, of course, as, as you look at the pyramid and you get down below, you see a lot of differences among uh, the, the populations. Uh, but as you, as you look at the theologians themselves, they all tend to move in the same direction. Um, but so Schopenhauer, back to him, is the first to incorporate Buddhism and is very negative. Uh, and as, as you saw in the article, what, what did you think of his major... Uh, astounding uh, argument about the nature of life. Depressing. Very depressing. Yes. Life is basically 
a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> Meaningless. So it's like nihilism, right? You know, that's interesting. There are some differences. I'm not sure if if uh, he would be considered a nihilist. Um, I'm not sure that any of the famous philosophers were nihilists. Even Nietzsche, I don't think, is a nihilist. Because there is a solution, actually. Uh, and for Schopenhauer, the solution is art. To use art to express the true nature of our experience. And he refers to this as the will. Uh, by the way, that's the same will that we see in this. This is a cult film now, and I think it's illegal in Germany. So that's the word will, right? Yes. considered to be one of the first uh, great examples of using film uh, in order to, to make propaganda. And I won't play much of this, but let me, let me scoot uh, through a little bit of it. If it doesn't look like it's letting me manipulate anything. The whole video is on there with English subtitles if you find the right copy of it. Uh, and so you can listen to uh, the various speeches. This is from the first party uh, uh, congress in Nuremberg, um, which would have been the 30s, right? Um, oh, okay. Well, so the reason I bring this up is because this is the Fuhrer's, whose who's will? are we talking about, right? Um, for Schopenhauer, the will is 
the will of the universe. So it's not, not my will, your will, each of us have our own will, but instead there's something basic in the universe that we might call karma or fate that, that is leading us towards a particular direction, right? Uh, and you can't, you can't resist it. Nature will have its way with you, right? Uh, and that's the way, uh, so we all die, you know. In fact, if you look at, you know, the time in the universe and Schopenhauer would have been on the, the edge of, of science learning that the whole history of the earth wasn't just 6,000 years or so, uh, but was instead an incredible uh, amount of time is they're, all, they're also beginning to realize that the earth has been moving and that there's different strata and, and, right, so, and this all would have taken millions of years uh, for all of this to happen, right? You know, so we've been here uh, you know, just a short little period of time and the universe has been here all this time so we're actually just a, a speck, not important at all. It reminds me of Carl Sagan's little blue dot. You know, when you, you look at Voyager going out in the space and taking pictures of the Earth from far out, you just see this little blue dot that makes us feel really, really small, you know. Um, and so Schopenhauer is infected with the same kind of uh, attitude that we're not important in the big picture, not only as human beings, but just me, myself. I'm not important, right, uh, at all. Um, and, and how else does this uh, affect uh, German culture? Um, and let me bring in, that's terrible. the composer Richard Wagner. How many folks have heard of him? Any? A couple. Um, so Wagner was very influenced by Schopenhauer. In fact, the um, main set of operas, four operas, uh, the Ring Cycle, he dedicated to Schopenhauer. And the main plot in this uh, series of operas is focused on the gods, Wotan especially, right? Uh, the king of the gods, the head of the gods, has his own desires that he wants to fulfill, but fate destroys them. So by the end of the four operas, which takes, I think, over 16 hours altogether, yes? Any of you seen the entire? Have you seen the entire Ring Cycle? No. Hitler famously saw the last opera one hundred times performed live. He also did a lot of math. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't illegal then. No. No. Um, we can blame Freud for a lot of that, actually. But the, um, the thing that, that strikes you is that uh, when Hitler uh, starts his wars and, and so on, he names things after the operas. So the Siegfried line, for example. Siegfried is one of the main characters in the operas. Um, uh, um, and how does uh, uh, he end up uh, dying at the end? Uh, um, he gets married and has a brief honeymoon in a ditch uh, covered in petrol uh, on fire, right? You know, that's how he spent his honeymoon uh, with Eva, right? Yes? Uh, yes? I, I, I was stationed in Berlin, so I got to visit the site where that would have happened, although they don't know exactly where it was, but his, his, his uh, underground uh, tunnel... Bunker was is there, um, and I, I remember at the time you could see it 
because it was on the other side of the wall. Uh, but And I haven't been back since the wall's been down. Uh, but I guess you could actually see some remnants of it. I don't know. I saw the movie, uh, the more recent movie, which was quite impressive. But the... Um, the, the way, so the way he ends up dying is basically an imitation of what happens to Siegfried and Brunhild in the movie. Uh, so it's almost too obvious to point out uh, that much of what uh, Hitler uh, put into play is almost an imitation of what goes on in the Wagnerian operas. Um, and the operas are based... In, in a sense, on Schopenhauer's philosophical view that, that nature is going to do whatever. You know, you might have your plans and have your hopes and so on, but nature is going to beat the crap out of you, basically. Um, but how do we rescue ourselves from this dilemma? Through our art. Uh, oddly, uh, Schopenhauer did not like uh, Wagner's operas. In fact, he despised them for a very odd sort of reason. Uh, Wagner uh, wrote the, the words uh, to, the opera, uh, to the operas in what he thought would be uh, kind of like an ancient uh, German uh, language instead of contemporary German, kind of like the Lord of the Rings, you know, the writing uh, that Tolkien gives us, you know, he gives you know, old languages, you know, and, I even remember Yoda does this, you know, when 700 years old, you will get, look as good, you will not, you know, says Yoda, you know, so all you have to do is screw up your grammar and it makes you sound wise, I guess, I don't know, um, try it, you should not, you know. <laughs> Although, in the word count, it will still be the same, but Windows might not let you do it, you know, because it fixes a lot of what I do. Um, so Schopenhauer didn't like Wagner. Uh, Wagner dedicated the, the text uh, to uh, Schopenhauer, sent it to him, and just, you know, the, the, the way Schopenhauer was an ir irritable grouch and mean to everybody, he was mean to Wagner as well, although fortunately Wagner never got to see uh, his response uh, because uh, Wagner had died uh, before he got it, but Cosima, uh, Wagner's second wife, um, she was furious because, of course, all the the things that Schopenhauer said, you know, she thought was were, were disgusting. Um, okay, but so let's take a look then at Sir Roger Scruton. In the uh, in the kitsch version that she uh, happens to, because if you if you have a look at his, this lecture and uh, a lot of his other works, in this particular one, he's specifically talking about <coughs> kitsch. Are you familiar with kitsch? What kitsch is? So, actually, he kind of gives a history of kitsch in this little uh, 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 speech. Uh, to an art uh, conference in California. Um, and he's very conservative. He also uh, does a BBC presentation on beauty, uh, which uh, is pretty famous, uh, where he goes around to a lot of the great sites in Europe and talks about what makes them so beautiful and so on. Right? Yes. So, um, but kitsch is crap. He talks about several examples of kitsch. And, and by the way, it's pretty interesting because one of the other individuals at the conference is Odd Nerdrum. That's his name, Odd Nerdrum. And he has a school of kitsch. And here's some of the examples of his paintings. Um, my favorite is Shit Rock. Let me see if I can find Shit Rock. <laughs> 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 
So, so here you have. <laughs> Should I apologize for putting that up there? Um, this is famous. Shit rock. Uh, you know. So, so you know, a lot of famous paintings have beautiful women lounging about, bathing by the riverside or in the woods, or I mean. You know, you know, you know. One of the, one of the. Well, he's making. He's obviously making fun of the that that kind of painting. Mm -hmm. Candid painting. Hold that spot for another hour. Hold that spot for another hour. I have to. I'm miss. Uh, sorry. You take candid photos, photographs. Uh -huh. Right, people in their life and the non-staged version. Back then don't do this. Like you don't take pictures of them yeah. shitting at the <laughs> rock. Plus the timing. Look, they're even all exactly the same size. You know, that's... It's motion blur. That <laughs> could be. Um, it looks like there's other versions of it, too. I, you know, I, I don't know. I think we're good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine, imagine Roger Scruton after you just hear him giving the lecture he, he gives about, you know, good art and calling all this kind of stuff crap, right? You know, and then you have Odd sitting there uh, defending the art. Um, pretty interesting, pretty, pretty interesting uh, because uh, of course, Odd is wealthy, famous, uh, you know, so he's paint, been painting uh, kitsch uh, and has a whole school of people painting kitsch. So, uh, you know, and of course, the, the issue then too is that um, uh, we, have, we have a whole culture that seems to be dedicated to crap. Now, that isn't, uh, I'm not sure that we have any kitsch here. Um, thank goodness. Um, but I mean, I could have brought some from home. You know, I've got plenty uh, of, of things that we've purchased uh, over the years uh, that easily, uh, uh, you know, fits that category. Um, you know, plastic art things, you know. I mean, go to a museum and you could buy the Pieta in plastic, right? You know, uh, you know, which is fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, except you know, it's it's a plastic toy compared to, of course, the real art and so on. Um, but I'm I'm puzzled because I have one piece that I bought at the um, University of Pennsylvania Museum of Art and Archaeology, which is a bust of Nefertiti, and it's beautifully done. It actually fixed her other eye. If you're familiar with the original, someone over the thousands of years that it was buried clawed out the one eye to supposedly uh, keep her soul from going to heaven, right? Um, but they fixed it for the, the kitsch piece that they sold me for a lot of money. But I loved it, and I still have it up on my desk, and it's heavy, so it's not just a... You know, and by the way, several earthquakes have not destroyed it, even though it's landed on the floor. So it's it's you know solid, um, not plastic, um, but I'm sure it still would be kitsch because it's just a copy of the original. It's not the original. Right? Is it stone? I don't know what. Well, it's it, it's very heavy. Heavy kitsch. It's heavy kitsch. Yeah, it's not cheap plastic kitsch. It's Heavy stuff. Um, I, I guess you would say bust of Nefertiti. Does Google find this stuff quickly? Because it's me, and it knows what I'm looking for. I, I still see. Here's both eyes are fixed, but her one eye was was clawed out, so this one looks like it's, yeah, see they clawed out something like that. 
But that's pretty interesting. But here's the, the issue. You're faking it. So what Roger is trying to talk about, I think, is, is the, the benefit of real art is the way it shines the emotional content of the idea. I'm misquoting his quoting of Hegel. Uh, so, so in a sense, real art communicates that, that something real. Like shit rock. You know, that's annoying uh, because it does communicate something real, doesn't it? It's, it's as, as he, he talks about humor, you know, you might look at it as a joke, like Duchamp's uh, ur urinal. He pronounces it urinal, right? Uh, if you've, you've seen his... Pardon? The fountain? Yes. Yes. Pisser, with it. right? Pardon? I'm familiar with Do you have one? No, I just seen that picture. That was nice. And I've yeah. used urinal. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah, just today, in fact. Um, <laughs> convenient. Um, but I wouldn't go to a museum to see it. You know, that's that's you know, that's hilarious. Um, most museums have them. That's what he says. Yeah, that you know, they're of course duplicates or you know, copies, um, etc. Um, but you know that but that's, of course, a puzzle that he plays with in, in that lecture, too, is that, you know, the humor is part of art. There's a lot of, of uh, art that's hilarious. Uh, you know, he, even faux interviews with our president, right, which could be absolutely hilarious. Uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, our, our art, but also can be interpreted in other ways. It's very complex. Um, so I suppose I should ask a quiz question. What should it be on art, obviously? Um, how about, uh, and I have to watch because I have the, the, um, the one quiz, or one test question I have is what sort of things in contemporary art do you find beautiful, right? Uh, that's one of the questions I have. Uh, and it's obviously a um, opinion question, right? You know, so if you tell me, uh, you know, a particular painting that you you see you like, you know, is you know your favorite, and I look at it and I say this is a velvet painting of Elvis, you know, and I'm like horrified, you know, you know, have you not seen, you know, Van Gogh or you know, all the, you know, I've been bamboozled by my heritage and culture and training to think of certain things as beautiful paintings, whereas, you know, a, a, you know, a picture of, of um, Elvis Presley on black velvet uh, strikes me as kitsch, right? Um, but who am I to say? That's, if that's what you like, and I know people who like that. Some of them are relatives that live in Las Vegas. Yes? Uh, what do you mean by contemporary? Like, what if it's like, does it have to be like modern or can it just be things in modern times or something? Like tattoos or something? Well, I'm, I'm thinking contemporary would be, uh, a, say, a living artist, someone that, that's alive today. But I suppose we could argue over that too, sure. Yes? Would you include things like architecture and music and things outside of the explicitly art? Well, yeah, art includes all of those. In fact, mm -hmm. this is an artifact. I'm sure. <laughs> so, but I'd, I'd rather not ask the same quiz question as what sort of things in contemporary art do you find beautiful? But maybe, maybe this. What do you find in art today? that is beautiful, but funny. That's a little different. Because 
he does have a great discussion about the role that humor plays that comes up in the question period in that discussion. So wait, what was the question? So what do you find beautiful, contemporary, what do you find beautiful but funny? In modern day? Yeah. Period? What would I pick? One of the first things I think of is Hey guys, it's Mark here at San Diego Promise. Uh, we know all too well from personal experience that uh, when it comes as part of the educational section of our program, here is Goldie Hawn, who will explain to you what the time zones mean. There are four time zones in the United States. For instance, if you're having lunch in Chicago, it's breakfast time in California. Of course, if you're in Chicago, you wouldn't feel like breakfast if you're from California because you've just had lunch. However, those living in New York, it's dinner time while we're still eating lunch here in California, which means the time is totally different as in the menu. All of this is caused by the sun, which cannot be everywhere, you know. Otherwise, it would never be night. We'd never know when to eat dinner. Well, in my time zone, that's all the time I have, but maybe in your time, I don't know why that popped into my head as an example of something that's beautiful and funny. She was younger then. Back then. That was when I was a kid. So, should we take a break? I have a question. Yes. So, that email you got about, uh, so next week we'll be at Mirroring. Mm -hmm. 